Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to my studio. It's a little cooler today because we've got some rain, but it's humid. It's muggy out here. Feels like Louisiana. Six of one, half a dozen the other. I don't know if it's any better. I probably can't last out here very long. I feel the beads of sweat starting to form on my forehead right now. I just got back from a trip to northern Arizona where I visited with Tori Hoops. She's a potter who lives up there who makes beautiful black on white replica pottery. And I thought you all might enjoy seeing how she works and getting to know her pottery a little better. So I've got a video to show you of my interview with Tori Hoops coming right up. The other thing I'm wanting to show you is some stuff I've gathered on my trip. I got some clay I'm gonna show you. I got a big bucket of clay over here. I'm gonna mail that today. And then I got this present from my friend in New Mexico. So I'll show you that after this video of Tori Hoops. So without further ado, here's Tori. years ago when we moved to this property, um, I happened to be wandering around and came across some corrugated pot shirts. Of course, I didn't know what they were. thought they were very interesting, um, very fascinating. I had to find out who made these. Um, I mean, I know a little bit about Southwestern pottery at the time, but not hardly anything. And so from then I did some research, uh, a lot of online research, to find out so much more about uh, this ancient pottery. And I got hooked. And this is kind of history from there. It's now become an obsession. I actually found a lot of information online that talked about it, but nothing as far as constructing did come across Swing's book, which had some more information, uh, but it wasn't complete. Uh, so there's a lot of holes. And in my online search, uh, out of nowhere, I found Southwest Film Conference. And they happened to be having one in Springerville, not far from here. So I decided to attend. And that conference actually filled in a lot of holes, especially on the firing aspect of it. Uh, and I've been experimenting with that quite often. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. I mean, you learn, you're always learning a lot from it. Um, no firing is the same. Uh, just too many variables. I'm more of a hands-on type of learner and uh, having that experience or experimenting teaches me in more ways than I would from maybe a workshop. I mean, it's great to collaborate with other potters who do this type of pottery. I um, mean, you do learn in that aspect, but uh, for me anyway, I mean, I just, I'm a born experimenter, I guess. I do like to try different things. I'm hoping, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll come across something that's different, uh, different than what I've been told or read about. And it's kind of like an aha moment, which is fun. And I can't wait to share it with you know, all the other uh, replicators. When I first started, I mean, I had no clue what I was doing. I just figured that, uh, well, these ancient people did it. Why can't I? I mean, it has to be fairly simple. You get in the firing aspect of it, and it throws a whole new curve into it. <laughs> I did break a lot, but I had a lot of misfires, is what I would say, or not what I expected them to turn out to be. I mean, I had a lot of red on white pottery, and I, I was always striving for that black on white, I get brown on white, and uh, it was frustrating. You know, and so you take a break from that and try something different. Uh, and that would turn out fine. Go back to trying to get black and white. Finally, you get successful. And okay, how did I do that? And review everything that uh, you did on that last fire, that particular fire, where you got good results. And like I said before, trying to replicate that time after time is very difficult in this environment.
there's so many pieces that you can replicate. You never get tired of it. There's also always something new. Uh, you'll come across something maybe on the internet that just inspires you. Uh, there's a never-ending source of designs and shapes that uh, you can attempt. And corrugation, I mean, that's awesome because there's so many ways you can do it, forms you can make, the sky's the limit. Well, my mother was an artist, not that she, you know, taught me anything. She was a painter, um, you know, not anybody who did any ceramics per se. The only ceramics experience I have is what, a semester in high school. <laughs> that's about it. But I'm the kind of person who, when there's something that interests me, uh, I just go at it 110%. Uh, and I just totally immerse myself. And I keep trying and keep doing something else. And, evolving uh, my techniques, uh, just something that really interests me, I won't quit. That convex or concave surface uh, adds a whole another element mm -hmm. to trying to paint on those. Um, the line may look straight, but it's not. Right. You know, it's like some people who tried to uh, draw some of the membranes designs on a piece of paper, and they end up not looking proper because they're actually painted on a curved surface, and you try and transpose that to a flat piece of paper and you get these differences. And it's interesting to paint on a curved surface uh, and get everything laid out properly um, so that it does look symmetrical, uh, which a lot of them sometimes aren't. Uh, right. I mean, they just, these people winged it. And I mean, their concepts of the designs and how they just did this it always makes me wonder, did they, you know, lay out a design with a little piece of charcoal or something before they painted it, you know, like we do with a pencil? Or did they just paint it freehand? And for a lot of these designs that come out symmetrically the same or just perfect all the way around is amazing. Uh, just some cool techniques. people who've done it before. Southwest Kiln Conference is a fabulous resource um, and experience I think is the big thing. You've got to make mistakes. You do. You, yeah. Yes, you do and you'll make plenty of them. I mean I continue to make mistakes. My first pot has actually gone back to the ground um, and it was a stupid little, it wasn't even really a pot, it was a silly little bowl that didn't even look anything like prehistoric pottery. And uh, my first corrugated pot, I mean, that one's a joke. <laughs> you learn to deal with that, and then that is how you uh, evolve and learn more, is by practice. I mean, you don't get perfect without practicing. Uh, and then there's been plenty of times where I've put a whole lot of time and effort into a piece only to have it not turn out and yeah I want to chuck it across the yard yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's where you know yeah you can't get attached to it but you do get attached to it especially once you've spent 10 hours of painting on a piece 
and you're hoping like crazy that it turns out for you and when it doesn't well then you get upset yeah but that's okay that's part of the process and just it's just a matter of experience experiencing all the processes taking your time with it and um, like I said take your time to feel how thick is that wall of clay that I'm dealing with is it thicker here thinner here it's a matter of taking your time uh, there's there's no rush uh, so take your time and learn uh, pay attention uh, all the subtleties that is involved um, from you know, building a pot, painting a pot, and then the fun part, firing it. Your failures do sometimes spur you forward to try again. Um, okay, I can probably make this better. Uh, how can I make it better? So you start thinking about those uh, different things on how you can improve. Yes, I do not teach a lot. I don't do a lot of workshops. I don't do any workshops because I do live well, fairly say, remote. However, this is, your first. This is my first. And <laughs> Sherilyn and I are doing a painting workshop uh, in, up at the uh, Southwest Kiln Conference. That'll be held in Blanding this year, uh, September 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm excited about that. Uh, it's going to be fun. Painting is one of my more enjoyable uh, parts of making this pottery. I do like to paint. So it'll be fun to share that uh, with all the people who sign up. It's $100 uh, if you want to paint a bowl, and you'll get a fully finished greenware bowl to paint, or $150 uh, for a mug. And you'll get all the different uh, skills and whatnot we can offer in painting, and then it'll be fired on Saturday uh, when we do the firings at the conference. And we will we'll supply, uh, we'll be supplying the bee weed because uh, that's the organic that we're using. Um, we'll show you how to make some brushes. Um, I'm going to be bringing some pre made brushes and some pre made hair yucca brushes for people to try. So yeah, I look forward to it. I've read so many books on pottery and I have quite the library of old archaeological books on different ruins and such and they've got great information on pottery. Um, Anna Shepard's book uh, Ceramics for the Archaeologist is good if you can get through it and decipher it. Um, I mean I have had that book for quite some time and I first went through it and it was like Latin, you know, <laughs> I don't know what the heck she was talking about. And so I've, over the years, as my experience has increased, uh, now it makes some sense. Very technical, that's the word for it. You know, when I first started researching about this, okay, these ancient people made it. They didn't have kilns, they didn't have pottery wheels, they didn't have, you know, stores to go purchase all this stuff. They made it themselves. Um, and they had to figure out how to do it. I mean, I imagine that, you know, there might have been a trader that came by or somebody who's familiar with it from, I believe, down in Mexico, and that's how the tradition started. Uh, and they gave them some information, and these people started experimenting. Uh, kind of like the same path I followed, you know? Let's figure it out. It can't be that hard. <laughs> Come on. The materials are all there. Yes, they are all there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting them in the right proportions and quantities and consistencies. And... That was great. I really want to thank Tori for letting me come out, visit her, interview her, film all that, and get to know how she works and the kind of pottery she's making, which is really gorgeous. And it's especially impressive given that she's only been doing this for about six years. Now, let me show you some of the clays I've got here. 
This clay is interesting because I collected it right across the canyon from the Four Mile Ruin, which, if you're familiar with Southwestern archaeology, is a really important ruin. Four Mile Polychrome, which is kind of the apex of Southwest polychrome pottery, is named after the Four Mile Ruin. And so uh, this stuff is kind of a greenish clay, and then it has these bands of yellow in among it. And so I'm interested in separating. I collected it all together because it was a lot of work to try to separate it. And then I'm gonna separate out the more yellow bits here in the studio and try to use the green separately from the yellow. Let's see what I get. Anyway, it's real interesting and it looks like a real pure clay. So I'm excited to try that, especially given that it was found right across from the Four Mile Ruin. I want to thank my friend Neil Thomas for showing me this clay and showing me around the Snowflake, Arizona area when I was up there. Now this, this package right here was given to me by my friend Wind, who's kind of a survivalist, lives off the land, uh, who lives up in the upper Gila area. So this was given to another friend to give to me when I was up at the field school recently. And I haven't opened it yet. I'm told that it's tepary beans. And there you can see some beautiful speckled tepary beans. Now Wind runs a little farm. He has a couple of acres that he tills and irrigates with corn and beans and squash in the summer. So these are beans that he grew. I really appreciate this gift. This is a wonderful, wonderful gift. I'd like to try growing some of these as well as eating some. Tepary beans are a domesticated bean that is adapted to the dry desert climates of the southwest so it grows really well with very little irrigation so i'm excited to try these i want to thank wind although he avoids technology like the plague so he'll probably never see this video still very nice of him and the other thing i have is this clay here now when i went up and tested clay a couple months ago uh, I was looking for a light colored or white clay up in the Mogollon Rim region. And this was the best clay I found. Really good working properties, I felt. And so I went back then and grabbed a whole bunch of it. Uh, I had to rush in my collecting, so I didn't quite get my bucket full because there were storm clouds approaching and it was about a five mile drive in there on a dirt road. And I thought if the rain got there, that road could get really mucky and I'd never get out. So I kind of rushed, but I'm glad I got what I did, a big bunch of this really good clay. So I'm excited about using this and making some pottery with this. Now, the priority mailbox, I promised Tori, Tori that we just saw uh, that I would send her some of this clay. I wanted to give it to her when I was up there, but she was busy and I was busy. So we never managed to cross paths after I collected this clay. So I'm gonna mail her a bunch of this clay. And the best way to mail clay are these priority mailboxes because they're flat rate. So it's like $15 to mail this size box, no matter how heavy it is. So I can literally fill it with dirt and it's still only $15 to send. So, and that'll give her a lot of clay. That'll be a lot of clay to mess with. So I'm gonna give her uh, some of this really good white clay, but I'm also gonna send her some of my yellow that I collected up there a couple months ago and processed so that she can try making some polychrome pottery with this yellow slip, this fire's red, of course. I hope you enjoyed my video today. I hope you learned something. If you wanna see that video where I was collecting these samples of clay up in the White Mountains a couple months ago, I'll put the link to that video right over here. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. I, I really want to experiment with that. For sure. It's something that's been on my mind for a long time and I just haven't got around to, but I think I'd like to see about getting reduced iron. That's what I'd like to get. Yep.